Let's all get some of Turn to page number 436. Page number 436. Let's all stand and sing the first verse to the Star Spangled Banner. 436. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we held at the twilight last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the rapids we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bomb bursting in air through the night that our flag was still there. Does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Turn to page number 438. 438. My country, tis of these 
land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, of the pilgrim's pride, every mountain side let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills and temple hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Our Father God to thee, author of liberty, they we sing. Long may our land be bright, freedom's holy light. Just by thy might, great God our King. Before we begin, this is Labor Day, and I know it's Labor Day. Okay, someone comes to me and says, uh, "Do you realize this is Labor Day?" I said, "Yes, I understand it's Labor Day, but I do have a reason for why we're doing what we're doing today, and it will all become clear as crystal uh, when it's all said and done. So, don't think I've lost my mind. All right, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for our country." Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we've enjoyed uh, uh, through these many years, Lord, that have provided or been provided us by our forefathers, Lord, and their uh, desire, Lord, to uh, establish a nation upon the principles of the Word of God, as you, the be, uh, as you being the supreme commander of all life, the creator of all life, the uh, the uh, in, in uh, to put the uh, natural laws into place. And Lord, I just pray today, Lord, as we join together in prayer. Uh, Lord, that we would pray for our nation. Our nation is in, in dire need of, uh, of a revival. Lord, I pray that revival would begin with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that uh, you would work in our hearts and our lives. Help us, Lord, to realize, Lord, that uh, we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I just pray this morning as we worship you that you would work in our hearts and our lives and that you'd help us, Lord, to, uh, to obey the Spirit of God as he works in our hearts and our lives. Father, I pray this morning for those who are able to be here, or there's some that are ill, uh, whether J.L.'s in the hospital. Uh, Lord, I just pray for him, Lord, that you would guide doctors and nurses in his care. Uh, Lord, there are some that uh, are, uh, have uh, uh, pending surgeries next week and the week after. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with those families. And then, Father, I pray uh, there are some that are traveling to you, giving mercies and grace, Lord, on this uh, Labor Day weekend. And, Lord, that uh, your will would be done and accomplished in hearts and lives. We give you the thanks for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday morning services of Garth Road Baptist Church. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you you'll allow me a minute, I'd like to draw your attention to Philippians 4, verse 4, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That whole book of Philippians is replete with the joy of the Lord. And it is a joy to be here to be today worshiping that God. Are you, amen? Y'all with me? Absolutely it is. And looking at our announcements, um, uh, Sunday school, as always, starts at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Our worship service begins at 11. Our evening service is at 6 p.m., and after tonight's evening service, there's going to be a social over in our, uh, our fellowship hall. I invite everybody to attend, and, and it's going to be on a potluck basis. You're welcome to bring your, your favorite dish to share with everybody, and I look forward to seeing you there. Um, beginning Sunday, November the 1st, our evening service will be changed to 5 p.m., so we'll start looking at that. It's never, never too early to mention it. And then, of course, Monday, September 7th, is a Labor Day holiday, and I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday with their families. If you're a visitor today, 
what I would ask you to do, if you did not fill one of these out to begin with, if you have a visitor's card in front of you uh, beneath the chair, if y'all would fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by, we would love to have a record of your visit. We're, we're, we're friendly people. We'll come by and say hello to you. Um, if you're a visitor today with us, we hope you come as a, as a visitor, but we really, it's our prayer that you leave us. I know everyone's going to get a benefit and a blessing from the worship to the service today. Again, thrilled you're here. Enjoy the service. Thank you. Turn to page number 435. Page number 435. Let's all stand. Far spacious skies, far amber waves of gray, far purple mountains, majesties above thy fruited plain, America, America. God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good to shining sea. O oh, beautiful pilgrim's feet to stern impassioned stress. A thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every form. Confirm thy soul in self control. Liberty and law, O oh, beautiful, for patriot dreams that seize beyond thy years, thine alabaster city's gleam, undimmed by human tears, America. America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood, see to shining sea. Turn to page number 437. 437, last some income for us to the offering. On the last verse, 437. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored, hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires. A hundred circling camp have built at him an altar in the evening dews and down and read his righteous sentence, the dim and flaring lamps, his day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his day is marching on. 
In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. In his bosom that transfigures you and me. She died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. While God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. While God is marching on. I love that song. While God is marching on, never stops, never turns, always consistent, always forward. Would that we could be one tenth of that. Proverbs 26.10 says, The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth the transgressor. The book of Genesis chapter 1 tells us nothing became everything when God told it to. Think about that for a minute. Nothing became everything when God told it to. You think you got problems? God created all that there is by telling it to be created. If he can do that, why do you think that your little problem is too big for him? That verse, that verse goes on to say, both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. Now the word rewardeth doesn't mean to give a special prize to, it means to give what you've earned. And he says, he's going to give to the fool what the fool earns. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So the person who doesn't want God will be forever separated from him. Then it says, and rewardeth transgressors. That's going to be people who believe in God, but you know what? They don't really want to obey God. God tells us in his word how to have the best life we can be, we can have here and in eternity. The problem is we want to listen to the world instead of reading what God says and doing what God says. And if God can command nothing to become everything, how much more can he take care of us if we simply follow his will? As we take up the offer, I'm going to ask Brother Roy to do something. Dear Heavenly Lord, we, we love you so much, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that we are trying to maintain in we enjoy today, Lord. I thank you that through it all, Lord, you have watched over and protected this country, Lord, even when we certainly don't deserve it. As we look around, we see the country turning against you and your ways, Lord. We pray that through this church, through the churches in, in this country, through the power of prayer, Lord, that we can turn this country back towards you again, Lord. And as we stand here before you today, Lord, we we thank you for the opportunity to give back unto you what is already rightfully yours, Lord. We pray that you take this offering and use it to your glory, to your ministry, to help us to spread your word through your world. And, Lord, our preacher, he needs you today, Lord. Give him the power of the Holy Spirit and speak through him. Give us the words that we need to hear from your Holy Bible to teach us to be better ambassadors for you, Lord, and help us to live up to the title of Christ life. And as we leave the church service today, let us remember that we are a light unto the world, Lord, and help us remember that as we go forth in all of our dealings with you. I thank you for your blessings and and just tell you that just give you a great big hug and say we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I have heard how Christians long ago were brought before a tyrant's throne. They were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name of Christ. But one by one, they chose to die. The Son of God, they would not deny. Great angelic fire sing. I can almost hear their voices ring. I pledge allegiance. To the land, with all my strength, with all I am, I will seek to honor His command. I pledge allegiance to the land. Now the years have come, and the years have gone, and the cause of Jesus still goes on. Now our time has come to count the cost, to reject this world, to embrace the cross, and one by one. Let us live our lives for the one who died to give us life till the trumpet sounds on that final day. Let us proudly stand and boldly say, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. With all my strength, with all, with all I am, I will seek to honor His command. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb of God, who bore my pain, who took Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3, 1 Peter chapter number 3. While you're turning there, uh, Labor Day was first uh, observed on in uh, May of, of 1882. It came about the, by the Central Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, who organized the first parade in New York City. 
and uh, after the Haymarket massacre in Chicago, Illinois, uh, on May the 4th of 1886, President Grover Cleveland uh, decided that uh, it would not be good to have that as a designated day, so he changed it to the first uh, Monday of uh, September uh, in order to keep there from being any problems every, uh, every May uh, that it was celebrated. And so that is why uh, it was to commemorate the, the work, the labors of uh, the working people and to uh, give them a day uh, to remember uh, what it is that they've done. And so I am well aware of why we celebrate Labor Day. Uh, but uh, with all that's going on uh, in our nation right now, uh, I felt that it was time to bring a message that uh, is a timely message. I think the song kind of put it there uh, for us in that uh, throughout uh, the history of Christendom, uh, there have been those who have tried to silence the voice of uh, the Christian uh, people. And uh, if ever there was a time that the voice of God was trying to be silenced, it is today. And uh, so uh, I invite you to with, turn with me to First Peter chapter number 3. Uh, I'll begin reading in verse number 13. I invite you to stand with me in reverence to the reading of the Word of God if you're able. If you're not able, I fully understand. I understand that more and more as, my, as I get older. But uh, please stand with me. First Peter chapter number 3, verse number 13 says, And who is he? that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? That's a question. Notice that question. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you or accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I want to call your attention back to verse number 15 and that phrase, be ready always to give an account of the hope that is in you. Given an account. I'll speak to you this morning on the subject, the fight for freedom. The fight for freedom. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you this morning, Lord, I, I am reminded over and over and over I have been, as I have been since June of this year of uh, the prevailing wickedness that has uh, been spreading across the United States of America. But Lord, it wasn't just in June of, of this year that the Supreme Court ruled uh, in favor of man and against the laws of God and the laws of nature. Lord, we've gone back to, we can go back to 1963, 1964, we can go back to 1945. Uh, there are numerous opportunities within uh, our United States of America, where we as Christians should have taken a stand, and we didn't. Lord, there were times that we should have taken a stand, and uh, as, a, as the Christian voice, as the voice of, uh, of the authority, uh, of your authority, to say, this is not happening in America, but we, we fell silent. Because we always had the philosophy, God, you're not going to let this happen. Or this will never happen in America. We're a Christian nation. And Lord, we have seen it fall time and time and time and time again. Lord, we're now in the throes of destruction. We are now at the place in society where the Christian voice is being silenced. We're being imprisoned because we take a stand for what is right. And Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that as we study the Word of God, and as we think about what's going on in our society, Lord, that we, as your children, would unite together in prayer and fasting, uh, Lord, that this nation would come back to you. Lord, I pray that you bless the message this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with thy Holy Spirit and with power. Lord, that the message would resonate in our hearts and our lives. We'll give you the thanks. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As Americans, we have experienced a lot of changes over the last 
few years, but amazingly, we have experienced a lot over this past month. The war on our civil services, the servants, the men and women who protect us with our lives, are being gunned down. being gunned down in cold blood murder while our president remains silent. Yet he is quick to respond when a white officer in the line of duty shoots criminals who refuse to obey their commands without knowing the facts and without waiting to hear the outcome of the internal affairs investigations without consideration of the officer's training and circumstances, he, the president, gets on national TV and blasts our men in blue. Why didn't we hear something when someone walks up behind a police officer feeling his police car and opens fire and fires 15 rounds into the police officer? Where was the cry? Over 16 officers have died or died in August. Eight of them in one week. Senseless killing. Senseless killings. For the president to do this, in my opinion, is a criminal offense. He's encouraging race wars in America, and he is to blame. He remains silent on the Ferguson, Missouri anniversary riots, thus leading, uh, lending his support to such heinous crimes against society and security of the people of that city. Now the county clerk, uh, Kim Davis, sits in prison for refusing to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and the Commonwealth of Kentucky while she took an oath of office to do in January of 2011. By the way, Kim Davis sits there without bond, which is a crime against her. It is a, it is a breaking of the law. She is not a violent criminal. She has committed no crimes, and she should not be in jail. In the video clip that I wa have watched numerous times, she is accusing, she's accused of breaking the law she swore to uphold. She asked, what law did I break? The response, the Supreme Court's ruling in June. If you know anything about government, and you should have learned something about government in school, <laughs> as an adult, you definitely should know something about government. There are three branches of law. There's the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch. The legislative branch makes the laws. The judicial branch upholds those laws and interprets those laws based upon what the law says. They do not make law. The Supreme Court of the United States of America since 1963 has been making law rather than interpreting. In 1963, when they said that prayer was unconstitutional and they could not pray in our public schools, they broke the law. They should have been disbarred, disbenched, uh, dis and put in prison. But they weren't. There was not a precedent set at all to take prayer and Bible reading out of our schools or the Ten Commandments off the walls of our courthouses. What law does she break? She broke none. The Supreme Court does not make law. They can only rule on the law. The U.S. Constitution defines marriage as between one man and one woman. The Kentucky Constitution defines marriage in this way by a 75% vote of the Kentucky citizens in November of 2004 in Section 233A. Valid or recognized marriage legal status of unmarried individuals. Only a marriage between one man and one woman shall be valid or recognized as a marriage in Kentucky. A legal status identical to or substantially similar to that of marriage for unmarried individuals shall not be valid or recognized. In January of 2011, Kim Davis took a law, took an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. She has upheld that law. She's been in prison for upholding that law. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, 
the judicial system broke the law by putting her in jail. In an interview with Glenn Beck, David Barton, a historian and a, the founder of wall, wall Builders, tells us that America is not a democracy but a republic and explains the difference between a republic and a democracy. And I quote, The Founding Fathers made it clear that the laws of God are higher than the laws of man. Every one of our Founding Fathers who wrote legal works made, it, made that point clear. The laws of man are not allowed to contradict the laws of God. That is why we are a republic rather than a democracy. He continues, in America, where we have a republic, we have a higher law. It's the law of God first, the Constitution second, the consent of the government third, and the social impact law fourth. On the other hand, a democracy has no higher power and rules, and rules based on that the majority wants at that particular time. Kim Davis did not violate any laws because she is basing her decision on God's authority, natural law, and then the constitution of her state and the First Amendment right to un inalienable rights of the United States of America, of which she swore to uphold and defend. Another, another interesting statement by Kim Davis in her unrehearsed dealings with a homosexual couple was, we will all answer to God and we will face the consequences of our actions, to which her accuser replied, I have no consequences. If you'll take your Bible, turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 1. The book of Romans, chapter number 1. Romans, chapter number 1. I begin reading in verse number 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you, that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You understand that? Those who thumb their nose at God and say, I have no consequences, <laughs> they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The fool had said in his heart, the Bible says, there is no God. Proverbs. Verse 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. Notice that phrase. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Can I submit to you today that the humanistic philosophies of our society, we are worshiping ourselves. We are not worshiping God. We are worshiping ourselves. We're doing what we want to do, not what God has asked us to do in his word. Verse 26, for this cause. God gave them up unto vile affections. That word vile means shameful, disgraceful, shameless, passion, inordinate affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the, that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, 
inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do it. Now, that's the eternal written word of God. Every one of us one day will stand before God and be judged according to everything that is written in his word. Jesus even tells us that not one jot or one tittle will pass until all will be fulfilled. She's also being un, uh, unjustly accused of discrimination because she refused to issue them a, a marriage license. However, she hasn't issued any marriage licenses since she be, this began. She is not discriminating against anyone. Liberal media will not tell you that. She's only refusing to give it to same-sex couples. No, she has not issued a marriage license to a heterosexual couple an interracial couple, or anybody else. So she cannot be discriminatory. Judge in Oregon, when the law was passed, told his court, we will not be performing marriages in this court for religious objection. Why isn't he in jail? He's not performed one, but he not, has not performed any marriages of any type since that time. 36 judges in South Carolina, or North, South or North Carolina, one I, I just read, uh, have banded together and say, we will not perform these weddings. The interesting thing about Kentucky, if you've not heard this, is the fact that uh, in Kentucky, they could go to any county in the state of Kentucky and obtain a marriage license. By the way, Kentucky law says that if you are married in a state that recognizes same-sex marriage and you move to Kentucky, we do not recognize your status. Interestingly enough, after the judge put uh, Kim Davis into jail for refusing to issue same-sex marriage licenses, not marriage licenses total, but same-sex marriage licenses, the lawyer said, well, if her signature is not on the marriage license, is it valid? And his response was, they'll just have to take their chances. So why is she in jail? He recognizes, or, or I'm sorry, she recognizes the judge that she's breaking the law. And for Kim Davis, or for them to issue licenses without her signature, they're breaking the law. So... <laughs> How is that going to affect you? How is that going to affect me? Greg Abbott, governor of the state of Texas, signed a law that protects all pastors in the state of Texas from performing, in all churches, from performing same-sex marriages. You say, well, we got a law. Great. That's awesome. <laughs> that law is only as good as the paper it's written on. Because they're not making the law based, or judging the law based upon what it's written. They're, they're making their own law. They're saying, this is what we say is going to happen, and you're going to do it whether you want to or not. That violates our First Amendment rights. That violates our Second Amendment rights. That violates every other right, our inalienable rights. It, 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 it affects everything that we do. We will be called in question, and I will guarantee you Something will happen in the state of Texas to challenge this. It will happen. And if the Texas Supreme Court rules against us, we have no, no hope. They say, what is Kim Davis doing in jail? She's reading her Bible. She's praying. She's sharing the gospel with folks that are in prison. That's exactly what will happen for me. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to give up. And it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Folks, this is not new. This is not new. Take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. I'm going to do a lot of reading, so I'm just going to start reading, and I'm going to go through it. I'll make comments as we go. But chapter number 4 of the book of Acts, verse number 5 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers of, and elders and scribes and Anas 
uh, the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kin of kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they uh, asked by what a power <laughs> or what authority, and that what they just asked him, Davis, what authority do you have this? Uh, or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if ye, we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye have crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here, uh, before you whole, this is a stone which the builders said it not, uh, not of you. Let me try this again. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among uh, given among in under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge. Notice this, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. May I submit to you that Kim Davis has never gotten angry. She's never yelled at those that are coming and trying to coerce her, force her to do something against the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Kentucky as well as the laws of God. And they're yelling at her. Notice this. They had been with Jesus. 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they said could say nothing against it, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with the, uh, to these men? For what for that indeed no notable miracle hath been done by them. Uh, let me try that again. For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them and they, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Let me stop right there. What, what is Kentucky trying to do? They're trying to silence Kim Davis. They're trying to make an example of her, hoping that other people will take notice and, and be silent. You can't do this, is what they're saying. Verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not uh, to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, we're going to keep on doing what we keep, keep on doing. Well, did they do that? Well, let's look over in chapter number 5. In chapter number 5, they were arrested uh, because they were in Jerusalem, they were doing many mighty miracles. In verses 12 through 16, uh, multitudes were uh, uh, were being healed, and people were bringing them, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Verse number 14, multitudes, both of men and women, and they brought their sick, and all of these. Verse number 17, then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord, by night, opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple of the, to the people all the works of this life. And when they had heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the uh, senate, uh, of the children of, or senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. And when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we uh, opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest heard, uh, and the captains of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto they, this would grow. And they came, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, uh, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before them, before the council and the high priest, and, and asked them, saying, Did not we uh, straightly command you 
that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, we have filled, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and attend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Ought to obey God rather than man. You will take your Bibles. You know these stories as well as I do, but it just helps to rehearse them. When you look back to Daniel chapter number 3, I'll not go through the entire story, but I want you to look at this. In the beginning of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar made a, 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 a statue, and he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon, and they said, now, when you hear all kinds of music, and he calls all the different instruments out there, that you're going to fall down and you're going to worship this image, this image of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse number 6 says, And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So when they, all the people, fell down and began, they heard the music, they fell down and started to worship. That's our society. We're just going to submit to whatever the government says, whatever the, the king says, whatever is going to happen. We're just going to fall down and we're going to do this and we're just going to be obedient because we don't want to spend time in jail. Believe me. You hear all of these things about air conditioning, air conditioned jails and all of these three meals a day and they'll get to watch TV. Well, they get to watch what the guards want to watch. I've seen their meals. Personally, I would probably be about the, the, the size of Twiggy. Now, I am dating myself because only the older folks know who Twiggy is. Okay? You younger folks have no clue who Twiggy is. But she was a model and she was about this big around. And that would be me because I definitely would have the issues with the meals that they serve at Harris County. Believe me. It's probably will happen, but just to say, I will probably be very skinny. And you go in there and you see some guys that are overweight and you're going, Really? But then I watch them at lunchtime and they're, they're just taking food off of other guys' trays who won't eat it. And they're just heaping it up and eating it themselves. And I'm going, okay, that's why. All right, never mind. That, I've digressed. Verse number eight. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Notice that. They came and they accused the Jews and they spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. <laughs> All right, Obama, we love you. We're supporting you. Change, hope, yeah. Verse 9, they spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree, and that every man that shall hear the sound, and they go through all the instruments. There are certain, verse 12, Jews from uh, whom thou hast set over the, the affairs. And notice this. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. Why was that? Because of their integrity? Because of their willingness to uphold the laws that were there and written? Because they were willing to do what they were supposed to do up to a point? Notice verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, has not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse number 13 is a very interesting statement. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded Shadrach to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought these men before the king. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready... That at what time you hear the sound and goes through all the instruments. God shall deliver you out of my hands. Or who shall deliver? Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Years have come. Tyrants have brought before them. I'll spare your life if you'll just reject the name of Christ. One by one they chose to die. Notice that. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. And I was thinking, I, I woke up about midnight, and I was thinking about that phrase, we are not careful to answer thee. I thought, why is that word not there? Shouldn't it be, what shouldn't it read like this? We are careful to answer thee in this matter? They said, we are not careful. In other words, <laughs> We're not going to think about this. We're not going to dwell on this. We're, we, we don't need time away. We don't need to take a sabbatical to find out whether or not we're going to do this. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will, notice this, deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Isn't that interesting? King, we don't even have to think about this. We're not going to worship your God. We're not going to bow down to the image. And we'll go to the fiery furnace if that's what's required. But, if God doesn't spare our lives, we're still going to do it. And we're still going to give him the glory. I notice in verse number 13, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury. Verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times hot more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Verse 22, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Stop right there. It was so hot on the outside that those that threw them in died because of the excessive heat. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, or astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto thee, O king, answered unto the king, o, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How did he know what the Son of God looked like? That has always troubled me. Every time I read that, that trouble. How does he know what Jesus looks like? Verse 26, The Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the prince of the governors and the captains and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was an hair of their heads singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed upon them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servant that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak and anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. What, ha what if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had submitted? Oh, King, we're so afraid of our lives. We're oh, God, just be merciful. Just, just let us buy this one time. No, they if they they would commit, they would bow down. But they were true men of God. 
I've said this several times over the last few months. It's coming to a time in the church where God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are the true believers. Those that are going to take a stand at work, those who take a stand uh, in, in their communities, those that take a stand uh, uh, wherever it needs to be taken for the right, just like Kim Davis. It's coming the time. And those that are playing church, the goats, those that are, uh, it's, it's, it's not important. I can, I can go to the, ball, uh, the, the, the baseball game or I can go to the football game on Sunday and not come to church because why? God understands. We're human and we need our entertainment. Do you realize that entertainment is an idol? You say, what's an idol? Anything that replaces God is an idol. And anything that you place in your life before God is an idol. What was placed before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was an idol. In Daniel chapter number 6, and I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but uh, i just relate the story to you. Most of you know the story by, by uh, reading it often and hearing it often. But Daniel was promoted over the provinces of Babylon. A chief ruler. Because of his integrity. Because he could be trusted. By the way, those who we have in elected offices right now cannot be trusted. In fact, the deal with Iran that is illegal from the American standpoint and American law has been agreed to by Congress. You say, what does that mean? It means that Iran can do anything they want to, and we can't stop. When they head towards Israel, they're going to meet an enemy, a force that they don't know what they're going to reckon with, and it is not—it is not the Israeli army. It is not Netanyahu. It is, it is not the people of Israel. It is the God of Israel. And by the way, this just in. Israeli intelligence surpasses anything America has. Anything. And you tell me they don't know what's going on in Iran? Oh, they know. And I'm sure they've already infiltrated. And I can guarantee you that before they let one nuclear bomb go, Iran will be toast. And it's by the power of God. Our government has said, oh, we support Israel. No, you don't support Israel when, you make, when you're going and saying, hey, this is all for peace. <laughs> it's not peace. It's control. When the Ayatollah Khomeini sits over there in, in Iran and says, hey, death to, to Israel, we're going to annihilate them. Death to America. Folks, why would we make a deal with a country that hates us and wants to see us destroyed? Why would we give them $16 billion? Doesn't make sense, does it? Anyway, back to Daniel. The jealousy of the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains. They all came in and they said, King, <laughs> you're the best king in the whole wide world. There's not been a king better than you. And this is a Jim Lamb translation, not a King James translation. And I have no authority. I'm just telling you the story. You're the best king. And we, we just thought, you know, what could we do to honor the king? And we thought about this king. And this is what we decided. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to write a statute that nobody can pray to any God but you for 30 days. And, we're, and we want you to sign that by the law of the Medes and the Persians. And if you're not familiar with the law of the Medes and the Persians, the law of the Medes and the Persians is, is once it's signed by the king, it cannot be changed at all. We want you to sign because we just want to honor you. Man, we want to. We just want to let you know how much we appreciate what you've done for us. The king wasn't thinking. He loved Daniel. 
when Daniel heard. Verse number 10. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to the king, and he said, King, why did you sign this? Now I can't pray for 30 days to my God. I just don't understand, King. Weren't you thinking of me when this happened? No, that's, that might be the ESV. That might be the New World Translation. Or some other perversion of the Bible. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. And his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. Let me stop right there for just a moment. You go, you know, well, it's okay to pray. Just don't be so visible. Why did he open his window to Jerusalem? Why did he, he kneel down by the window? Why did he do this? There's an answer for that. Second Chronicles 7.14. You say, what do you mean, Second Chronicles 7, 4? Because Solomon prayed, if, if the people turn from you and we go into captivity and we pray towards this place and, and, and we call out to you, God, would you hear our, our prayer? Would you forgive our sin? Would you heal our land? Would you restore us? And God says that my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. By the way, Ed Young forgot that very important statement at the funeral. He quoted 714, but he left turn from their wicked ways out. And I caught that just like that. Was it an oversight? No, it wasn't an oversight. You say, how do you know that? Because at the end of the message, when he should have given the gospel, he passed over. The chaplains did a better job than he did in that. Say what you will. But we shouldn't give a message to a captive audience. Folks, when do we give the message? When do we give the message? Hope and change is not the message. Jesus Christ is the message. God says, verse 15 of First Chronicles 7, Second Chronicles 7, 14 and 15, Now my eyes are open and my ears are attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. We never use that verse. I do it every time I close the line. Because God says, I'm waiting for you to call out. I'm waiting for you. Daniel had his window open towards Jerusalem. And he knelt down three times a day. What was he doing? He was praying for God's mercy upon his people. He was crying out to God. That God would restore them back to their nation. Those that were accusing came to the king and said, Oh, king, you know we, 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 you signed that degree. You know that it can't be changed. Verse 14, when the king heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart to, on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, now, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. The king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake unto, and said, unto Daniel, thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den of lions, den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his two lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Verse 20. After a sleepless night, verse number 20, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee or from the lions. Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent, hath sent his angels and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, 
and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Interestingly enough, all those that came and brought the accusations against Daniel were cast into a den of lions, and their bodies were broken and destroyed before they even hit the ground. You say, what does that mean? It means that God's going to vindicate his children. And those who have not fallen under the hand of a mighty God trusted him as Lord and Savior of their lives, rejected God's offer of a free gift of salvation are going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Hell hath no fury for the child of God, shown in Daniel chapter 3. If we could go to hell, we would not burn, because our soul is eternally safe, sealed with the power of God. Place is an awful place. Hell is an awful place. Place of torment. For the worm dieth not, Lord Jesus said, and the fire is not quenched. It's an eternal place. Eternal place. And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Folks, if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you need to find him. If you're here today and you're playing church and you're saying, you know, I'm just going to wait my chances. i got plenty of time. The prophetic clock has been ticking for a while. Since May of 1948, it's been clicking. Second by second, we don't know the day nor the hour of the Lord's return. That's for sure. But things are gearing up right now. On the 24th of this month, Pope Francis, who is not supposed to be a pope, according to Catholic canon, a Jesuit priest cannot be hold the position of, of pope. It's in their canon. It's in their law. And they went outside and said, no, we're going to take a Jesuit this time. First time in the history of Catholicism. First time. What's his message? Change and hope. We're changing the laws of Catholicism. And we're going to accept the homosexual lifestyle. Not a surprise since that's been common practice amongst priests for years. We're going to accept the homosexual lifestyle. Women who have had abortions, we're going to absolve you of your sin. I yelled at the TV the other day when I, read, when I heard that, as if they could hear me. Nobody has the right to absolve sin except God. And you must fall under the judicial hand of God through the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood, and that's the only way your sins He'll be in Washington, D.C. on September the 24th this month with President Obama to bring unity amongst religions. By the way, Rick Warren, other liberal pastors met Pope Francis in Germany last year to lend their support of a one world religion. You say, where is that coming from? Prophecy in the Word of God. It's coming, folks. If you are not right with God and that trumpet sounds, and the Dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain are caught up together to meet them in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, the Bible says. If you're not saved, if you do not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior of your life, you will be left behind. And then you need to read Revelation chapter 6 and follow. Torment, destruction, like you've never seen before. Daniel, chapter number 7 to the end of, the, of Daniel. 
Ezekiel 37 to the end, you'll find out that God has promised a judgment upon this world like never been seen before. And folks say, well, if, I, if that happens, then I'll get saved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Please read it. Now, when he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, then that wicked shall be revealed. And God will send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. I read something interestingly enough, and I haven't really researched it to find it out, but I read that the Vatican has a telescope that is that's stronger than the Hubble. It has infrared with it. They can see things that the Hubble can't see, supposedly with this. Have you noticed the, the major talk recently about UFOs and life on other planets? What do you think the excuse for millions of people disappearing off the planet is going to be? Well, UFOs came and, and captured them. Took them away. Praise Allah. We don't have to deal with them anymore. We're what's letting... We're, we're, we're the voice right now. We're the protector for society and for the world. If we're not right with God, we're going to let this world die and go to hell. But we're okay because we're going. How, where do you stand with God? If you were to die right now, do you know 100% sure for a Bible reason you have a home in heaven? If not, you need to make that sure. If you're saved, what are you doing to serve the Lord? How are you living for God? What is the answer? The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Will there be a major revival in America before, before the Lord comes? I don't know. But there could be if God's people would come together. Obey Second Chronicles seven fourteen and look for Second Chronicles seven fifteen. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you tonight this morning for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness and your mercies and your grace towards us. Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning. Lord, I, I know this is Labor Day. But Lord, America is in a mess. Laws are being made. Businesses are being sued because they have a religious conviction against certain sins. Lord, I just pray this morning, Lord, that those of us who are saved would commit ourselves to fasting and prayer for our community, for our, for our nation. This is our only hope. Father, if there's somebody here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, I pray that they'll come to know him today before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. God, deal with your heart. You come to an altar. You come.